how the heck do you make money in magazine media these days? Right? That was a topic of conversation last night. Malcolm Forbes, founder of Forbes magazine, had a great idea. I made money the old-fashioned way. That was very nice to a wealthy relative right before they died. <laughs> but not everybody has an aging, rich relative, right? And unfortunately, there is no one super solution to making money, which in a way is a very good thing because the last time we relied on one or two solutions, classified subscriptions, etc., that was a disaster when one of them went south. So now, it's all about diversification. We have so many ways to make money. Reader revenue, content marketing, distributed platforms, e-commerce, events, messaging apps, mobile, native, newsletters, programmatic, retail, and video. So today, though, we're going to talk about content marketing. So what is content marketing? The only way really to talk about content marketing is in the context of traditional marketing, because it is the antithesis. What is traditional marketing? It's outbound marketing, so-called interruptive marketing, the marketing you grew up with. So what it does is it's a blunderbuss. They have no idea who they're reaching, so it's like a, a shotgun. The more pellets you put out there, the better chance you're going to hit the rabbit, right? With ads for products nobody really wants when they're looking at it. When you're watching a television show and an ad comes up for a, a Ford Fiesta, I'm not in the market for a Ford Fiesta. It's not relevant information to help consumers solve a problem, fill a need, or buy a product. Because they're not there for that. And it's all over the place. It's not just in magazines, it's on billboards, it's in radio. You're interrupted constantly. Content marketing, on the other hand, is inbound, <coughs> excuse me, or permission. Because you're finding it because you want it. Non-interruptive, <coughs> creating valuable information users can find when they want it and need it. Educating potential consumers and drawing them in. So it's the art, and it is indeed an art, as we'll get to later, of talking to your consumers without aggressively selling a product. That is the hardest thing in the world to do when you're talking to an advertiser who just wants to sell another tire, right? But you can't do that. So instead of pushing products, it makes your users more intelligent, makes their lives easier, solves their problems, and fills their needs. Because everybody comes to the internet with a need, with a purpose. And if you're hitting them with something unrelated to that purpose, you're considered to be harassing them. Hence, ad blocking. But inbound, or native, and content uh, marketing adds value to their lives. Showing your expertise so they, become to, they get to look at you as somebody who really knows your stuff about manure spreading. Or something. There's a magazine group I met here last time I was here that has a magazine called Manure. They make a ton of money off of shit, which is fantastic, right? And, and inbound marketing, or content marketing, can take many, many forms. Blogging, podcasts, videos, quizzes, white papers, etc. So what are the differences between content marketing and traditional? It says pop quiz here, so you're supposed to raise your hand. Oh, come on. What are some differences between traditional marketing and content marketing? Take a wild ass guess. Okay. Yep. Yep. Analytics, though, in real time. Real-time analytics. You can do an, an, an analysis of a television campaign, but then it's only good after, when you do the next campaign. You can't fix this one. Somebody else? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. One is one way. The other is trying to establish a relationship and a conversation. Somebody else? Yeah. Right. It does. Yeah, it's beginning to establish a relationship between you and the customer, and that's what selling or marketing is all about. It's getting that relationship going so they then act on it at the bottom of the funnel. Okay, one more? Any more? Yeah. 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 It's not something they created to try to reach as many people as possible. It's created with a specific consumer in mind. Okay? So, okay, here we go. Permission versus interruption. Traditional marketing interrupts you when you're doing something else. You're watching television. You're not coming to find an ad for uh, you know, a bra, right? Or you're driving, or you're listening to the radio. And, and interruptive is not just print, but it's all these other horrible things. 
right? Especially those damn things that pop up and start playing right away. It's like, oh my God. And then you can't see where it is to, to turn the damn thing off. And it's sought out and consumed when they want it, so they have given you their permission to market to them. I'm really looking for a new lawnmower, so I start to look up things. And here's, a, here's content marketing from a company that makes lawnmowers and talks about maintenance of lawnmowers and efficiency and how high to have the blade and all that kind of stuff. It's an earned versus a rented audience. Okay? So traditional marketers pay platforms, newspapers, magazines, billboards, for access to their audience. Whereas, and so they're rented because they're not there for your message. They're there to do something else. Same thing with these guys. But content marketing offers something of value. People who discover and choose the content because they want to get it. That's what they're looking for. And you own that audience. You're not renting them temporarily. You're not buying them and hoping that they'll pay attention. You own them. 63% of millennials say that they would that they trust content that they find on their own versus ads. That's big. That's a lot of people. And as you mentioned earlier, it's a conversation. It's not one-sided. You know, traditional advertising is a megaphone. Hey, <laughs> this is what you should buy, right? Traditional doesn't ask for a response. It's just it's it's just throwing stuff at you. It's assaulting. They hope somebody will buy something. Content marketing starts that conversation. It gets them engaged so they be like and trust you, and ultimately buy something. This is the other flexible. You can't change the analytics thing. Traditional marketing campaigns, they're static. They're launched, and then at the end of the day, you look at the results. You can't say, oh, well, let's go change that ad because it just doesn't appear to be working. It's running. Once they're out there, the only adjustments you can make are next time. But content marketing campaigns can be honed in real time. You can enhance the strategies that are working and ditch the ones that aren't. So your analysis gives you an, the ability to be flexible. This one I like. I hadn't even thought of this one. I found this not too long ago. It's momentum building, content marketing is, versus one time. So it's kind of like this guy compared it to flywheel marketing. You know when you're first starting to row, you're first starting to pedal, it's a hard thing to get the momentum up. But once you get it going, it's just maintenance. And so the effort involved is far less. So what it is, it's hard to turn that wheel. But once you're going, you're powerful. And, and, and if you ever have, and I have, and I'm sure you have too, started a blog or started some sort of social media campaign, it is really difficult to get going. Earning those first links, the first rankings, the first few followers, it's really hard. And what a lot of companies who get into this for the first time come at it after a week or two or three and say, wait, you know what? Let's just throw some money at paid search and at ads and, and let's screw this whole inbound marketing thing. It's not working, right? And we're going to get to measurements and timetables in a minute. But if you don't have goals and if you don't accept the fact that it's going to take a long time, then the CEO, the head of advertising can come and say, it's not working. It's not working. Let's kill it. Let's go back to the old way. But a weird thing starts to happen. As you earn links, you build loyalty, you increase your reputation, SEO gets easier and easier. And then, son of a gun, you write a post, you hit publish, and you're already on the first page. Because you have built up that reputation, that SEO, and people are beginning to follow you. Appreciated versus tolerated, I think tolerated is not quite strong enough. Resented, hated, <laughs> loathed, right? Content marketing is not only easier and more affordable, but it's more appreciated and better liked by your audience. 89% of B2B marketing decisions turn to search engines. They don't turn to, a, let, let's go look at some display ads <laughs> to see what we want to do, right? 70% of consumers would say they'd rather know a company through articles than ads. But to make this work, you have to remake your whole organization. It's not going to work if you continue as it is. And listen to this guy. We're seeing this transformation of marketing departments that were set up long ago in those mass media days. They've transformed into publishing departments. And we've really seen that. And it's a big struggle for large enterprises because you have to dismantle what we've built over the past 30, 40, 50 years. The brands who get it have transformed the brand. They've become something else. And part of it is from letting go of this idea of, you know, we own everything about the brand and trusting that if you engage a whole lot and give some of these brand values 
to your customers. Something good happens, and something good that you can't even predict. And, and because it's so new, if you have something going on like this, then you might be in better shape. But in most cases where you're first starting this, nobody believes in it except maybe one evangelist. And that evangelist has got to be given power. Listen it to this. really starts with appointing someone or understanding there needs to be a custodian of the audience's viewpoint within the organization. You've got to have tremendous buy-in, top to bottom. That's key. You've got to have a, a central organizer, that chief content officer, whatever you want to call that person, the content manager, and you've got to start off on the same page. They need to make a lifestyle change, and they have to swear off spending money on the stuff that doesn't work. And they have to say to themselves, every single day, I'm going to create content. Every single day for an hour or two or, or entire day, or if I'm a big company, 10 people's entire days have to create content full time. Now what you're noticing here is they're saying they, they, they. This is the kind of approach you would take with advertisers. Because you're not going to be creating content marketing for yourselves. I mean you might, but the biggest thing is how do you sell content marketing to your potential clients, or your existing clients? How do you transition them from display ads to content marketing? And so that's what these guys are talking about. You have to convince them to start sharing with you, trusting you as storytellers and the people who have the audience on how to do this. So what are the benefits if you do all this? Well, it, it, if, if nothing else, it avoids ad blocking because most of them are put into the, into the context of the story, right? And ad blockers can't see those. 7.8 times more traffic. Brand recall. 37 seconds, that's a long time on an ad, on what is an ad. 62% less costs and generates three times the number of leads. Six times higher conversion rate. At this point, you should be saying, oh, this is, this is a no-brainer, right? This is <laughs> one of the most effective forms of content marketing is email marketing, good old email. For every dollar spent, email gives back $38 in return on investment. You can't get that kind of return on, on anything else. So those benefits are why content marketing is one of our greatest opportunities, but it's also why it's one of our greatest threats. And here's why. Advertisers have figured out, hey, we can do this ourselves. We don't need the magazines. We can write stories, right? They can't, but this is what they think. So here's this guy talks about this, and listen to this. This is not good news. Please. Instead of having to advertise in someone else's channel, I have the opportunity to create my own valuable, relevant, and compelling content in our own channels to really create loyalty, build relationships directly with what we like to call subscribers instead of going out and having to pay for that attention. I think we have to change the way we think about, uh, about you know, getting access to the mind of the consumer we want to have a relationship with. And one of the best ways to do that today is through content. That's not good. <laughs> they think they can do it themselves. And some are. There are some companies, you'll hear it from a guy from Marriott here, they have massive newsrooms, massive editorial departments. So what do we have? What are some of our advantages? If somebody says that, they're, they're a client, they're an advertiser, they say, you know what, we're, we're going to back out, we're going to create our own content. What could you say back to them to, to disabuse them of the idea? Right. Okay, another one? What else do you bring to the table? You're looking at $10,000 walking out the door, $100,000 walking out the door. I'm sorry? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Writing skills, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, big brand is extremely, you know, things have been, the whole media industry has had trouble. But brands still have value. I worked at the LA Times for a while, and I had to try to find some bloggers in South Central LA. And I thought, we, don't, we didn't even distribute there. And I called them up, and I said, we really like your blog. Would you like to be in the LA Times? And they said, oh, really? You know, we had abandoned that neighborhood, but the brand of the LA Times was so. So your brands have a lot of value. And here's, here's why I think we can still win, OK? Trust. Right? 
consumers are finicky. If a brand sends you a white paper or something else, ah, come on, they're selling me something. I know they're selling me something, right? So media companies have trust and loyalty built into your brands. Years and years and years of delivering high quality content servicing their needs. So what we have found in research is that if a media company produces great relevant content, even for a client, right? You are allowing it on your site, you're giving it that imprimatur and saying this is good because I'm allowing it here, the audience will trust that too. Audience, we said audience. It's hard to build an audience. You've spent decades, right, building an audience. Advertisers are attempting to build it from scratch. So they'll put stuff out there and they'll get 10 followers. You know, then 20. Ooh, they doubled it, right? And for them, great content deserves to be seen, but they're going to be cranking out content that's going to sit on their website that nobody's going to find for a long time. You guys, we bring niche audiences already predisposed to learn about the topics and purchase products related to the niche that the advertiser is trying to reach, right? Meanwhile, they have to rely on organic search, right? That's just not going to work for, again, for a long time. And talent, right? 32% of marketers have had trouble finding trained marketing professionals. That doesn't stop them from putting out content, which sucks. Right? But they don't know. They're not in the business of creating content. They can try to build teams from scratch or work with you guys. You are storytellers. That's what you do. So you can sell them on the idea, look, we know our business. You know your business. Don't waste your time and money trying to learn a new business you have absolutely no business being in. Because you don't know what is a good story. You don't know how to write a good story. You don't know how to edit it. You don't know how to illustrate it. You don't know how to, don't know how to put elements in it, like video and so on. It's, it's a learning, a steep learning curve for a company putting out baby carriages. Right? Oh, we've got to have a newsroom. And the process. And this is really important because the advertiser can't control that. We have the ability, we control end-to-end -end process from creation to publishing, audience targeting, distribution, and reporting. They wouldn't have to just assemble a team of writers. They'd have to get all this other stuff going too, which you guys already have. And then I mentioned ad blocking. So we can avoid the ad blocking software using content marketing. And then it's context. Because the content is in the editorial stream, it appears seamlessly on whatever devices are being used, whereas the, the advertiser is going to have a much harder time, if for nothing else, dealing with the differences between iOS and Android. Why should they have to learn all this stuff, right? And can be put into feeds for third-party platforms and more easily shared. This is second nature to you guys by now, I would hope. All right, so what are some key measures of the success of content marketing? Just some guesses here. What would you think? Sales. Bottom of the funnel. What? Leads, yeah, yep. Sorry? Views, yep. All right. What to measure. So there are lots of different ways of looking at this, right? More broad, like audience size, behavior through top of the funnel. Experiment with purchase driving content at the bottom of the funnel. Identify, and this means that consulting approach with your advertisers. Identify pain points in the conversion process. Map each piece of content to conversion goals. This content is designed to do X. This content is designed to do Y. Top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom, bottom of funnel. And then talk to the advertiser about what stages does their audience go through before making a decision. Where's the bottleneck? What's causing the trouble? Where is that? How can we create content to get readers past that? And then what metrics? Do we have the tools? You might find before you go out and start these things, you need to acquire some tools to provide the kind of measurement that the advertiser will be looking for. Macro goals, micro goals, what's the process? So at the top of the funnel, you could look at things like average time on the page. Are you getting their attention? Bounce rate, conversions related to goals, and middle of the funnel, this is a client who's got a lot of qualified leads but not much in terms of customers. So what do you do in the middle of the funnel to move them through that? 
And that could be things like average time for a lead to become a consumer. And these are all extremely measurable. You can show progress, email engagement, repeat visits, downloads of white papers and so on. And at the bottom, this is an interesting idea. So they have strong interest, but they don't buy. So present half of them with content and the other half not and evaluate what happened between the two. Half of your audience gets some stuff from you, some content marketing, the other half doesn't. What are the differences in behaviors? And post-sale, you know, taking, keeping your, your clients and customers engaged with you, lifetime value, repeat purchases, evangelism, looking for people who are going to promote you as, as customers. And then another way to look at it is across this customer journey. So in the awareness level, you might look at keyword rankings, impressions, Search visibility under interest, you'd look at web, webinar registrations, evaluation, quote requests, demos, decision making, the conversions, and retention, shares, comments, etc. Now here, this is, this is like, you can't possibly read all this right here, right? So this is available in the PDF, and we're going to walk through it really quickly, broken down. So here's the measure, and there are brand measures, content performance measures, and commercial. So for example, under reach, the very earliest stage, right, you're looking at unique visitors, new audience share, and then for the content performance, the share of the audience, key sites with your content visible, fans, search inbound links, and then for the commercial measures, and then it keeps going. So then we look at the action measures, and then we look at the conversion measures, and then we look at the engagement measures. And again, this is all on the PDF, so you can break it down and take a look and see what works for you. So we've got, you know, the, there's no lack of things we can measure. The hard part is deciding which ones prove the success of the campaign according to the goals that the advertiser says are his or hers. So whether you have a, a sales team back at your operation of one or 20, you need to convince them, right? If they are at all traditional, this is something completely new. So you could start with empathy, right? Help them realize that content marketing has benefits beyond revenue. And their empathy would be, do they like being interrupted, right? Or wouldn't they much rather have their questions answered when and where they want them answered? So you could say, how much, how do you really enjoy those pop-up videos that, that irritate you so much? Let's do some content marketing. Or take a look at long-term goals. Mentioned this earlier, the content you create today is going to be available long into the future. So the investment that you make in that stuff is pays off over time. It's like a 401k, compounding. And then worse comes to worse, go with fear, right? I did this with a client, a nonprofit uh, north of Boston, and showed him that he didn't even show up on search results. And his direct competitor was the first page. So we had fear like that. So scare them. Go out and demonstrate your competitors showing up. What are the keywords you want have to identified with your brand, and then go and look and see if you show up for those, or if your client does. Most of the time they don't, because they haven't thought about it. And then, once you've got all this stuff done, you really have to think it's all about quality. Because you can do all this stuff right, but if when they click on the content marketing link and it's crap, it won't work. So this is the head of Marriott uh, Promotions. I have a presentation that I give here and globally called Publisher Parish. All right, the idea if we don't start publishing, we're gonna, not going to be around or not be relevant. It's the idea that today, as a brand, we're all really media companies. It goes back to all of us are media companies. So the Marriott Global Creative and Content Studio is focused on developing content. Digital projects, we've got TV projects, we've got film projects, uh, we've got stuff in animation. Great storytelling comes from people who know how to tell stories in the creative community, right? So we partner directly with mainly influencers across YouTube, Instagram, and other um, channels, but also traditional talent in Hollywood, producers, directors, writers, to create content for us. Now that's scary, right? That earlier one about that guy saying, we don't want to advertise, we want to just do our own. Same thing here. These guys are creating very high quality content. Now not all of your advertisers are going to be in the same position to be able to invest like these guys. But, you know, I do my blog, I take very high quality video with this. Every one of your advertisers has one of these. 
And if they figure out that they can go do that, then they have to hurt, co cover the other hurdles of audience and so on. But Okay, native, which I'm going to talk about at 315 right back here, is a form of content marketing. Uh, but it's risky, and we'll talk about the risks at 315. So here's some examples of successful content marketing. Xerox. So they did, they wanted to boost their pipeline revenue, and they created a targeted campaign to engage their top 30 accounts. That's a pretty small number of folks, right? They partnered with Forbes to create a magazine offering relevant content to that, that audience. Over 70% interacted with Xerox's microsite. They saw a three to 400% increase in readership compared to earlier. But more importantly, they generated, this is unbelievable, 20,000 new contacts, 1,000 scheduled appointments. That's just ridiculous. 1.3 billion. By any measure, that was a success, right? Just with a magazine. Just with a magazine. PC vendor Asus. I'd never heard of these guys. And yet they're the fifth largest PC vendor. And they wanted to, because they knew they too were unknown, they, they thought, okay, how do we fix that? So they partnered with Microsoft to create a content marketing campaign. Editorial customer uh, content, videos, articles, et cetera, eight countries. It earned four million visits, 16 million users. That's big. They exceeded their objectives by 60%, 16% in sales, 2.6 million increase in computers, computer sales. ADP, data processing company, they do business processing services. So they did a quarterly multi-touch campaign, digital assets, infographics, cookbooks, et cetera. So their results, 3.7 million in revenue, 3.23 uh, in the pipeline, and a return on investment of 900%. Sainsbury, grocery store in the UK. They started with a magazine, and it became, this is just ridiculous, right? Became the largest fully paid for food title, and it was run by a grocery store. Too many other advertisers hear these stories, and, and we're in, in deep trouble, right? Then they added, you know, they didn't sit on their laurels, they added a companion website, portfolio of social media content channels, sold out cooking demonstrations, weekly newsletters, a food and drink award night, <laughs> and then a series of editorial one-shots. So these guys are a monster. Their results, 50,000 newsletter subscribers, 35% open rate, which is really good, and the click-through rate is fantastic. 24,000 Twitter followers, 162,000, and the key one, 81% have cooked a recipe after it, but this one, 80% bought a product from Sainsbury to use with the recipe that Sainsbury gave them. Okay, Here's another one, Lenovo, a B2B tech vendor. They wanted to move beyond price-based messaging, in other words, you know, push advertising, for a share of their attention. So they created an always-on integrated approach, seven languages about topics to IT decision makers. 300,000 users, tripling the engagement rates, 24% increase in earned media value, and their lead increased by 63%. This is a bank. This is a bank in Denmark. And they, well, you'll hear this story. This is another scary one. Yuska Bank is one of the largest banks in Denmark. And for years, they were paying a lot of money for sponsorships. And they, they didn't want to do that anymore. They didn't know if that was a good use of of their resources. So they created Yuska Bank TV, uh, targeting to financial consumers, and they started to answer questions on this video channel about how consumers can save for retirement, how they can get uh, checking accounts, savings accounts, do things with their lives financially, um, and they were starting to share information like a media company would. Uh, we say that if you can't rely on the media, you have to become a media, and that's basically what we, what we think. My name is Rasmus Wilson. I work as a host and journalist here at Jyske Bank. Well, since it started in 2006, we started doing internal uh, communication uh, on TV, and then in 2008, we started uh, also sending to our customers. The hard part is, is not to produce the content. It's to get 
the right idea for the content, and then they get the, the big yes from the CEO and the company. So you, 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 you're getting in there. We have had our CEO call us and say, hmm, that, that wasn't my kind of story. But, but that's all right, I, I'm still here. So, so, but but we need, you need to have that kind of CEO that thinks, okay, all right, I'll give you some freedom and, and, and I won't uh, intervene. Uh, but of course, he will have an opinion. But he believes that if you tell it as a journalist, people will believe it and people will, they will like it. It's been a long process about getting where we are now because people are very uh, skeptic about this. Uh, but, but every time we do a story where people say, oh, that's actually what we were talking about in the canteen, so, so great that you guys are talking about it also, uh, even though it's, it's kind of a bad story for us. But, but people are talking about it anyway, so, so if we don't talk about it, it will just you know, grow bigger and bigger in the uh, organization. You earn the respect uh, from the audience. You have to get good stories that go into people's hearts. And when you, get, when, you, when you reach people's hearts, they will do uh, the right things with the brain. Think like a, like a publisher. Uh, produce content that is relevant for your audience. You have to believe that this is the right way to go. Uh, and and I, I don't think it's just the right way to go. It's the way, it's the way you have to go. All right. Now, here's another content marketing example that you may be familiar with. You ever heard of these guys? No? Oh, you're in for a treat. These guys make blenders, okay? I had no idea that this would turn into such a monster, a good monster. I've always wanted to have the fastest, the most powerful thing I could have. So for a wedding present in 1968, I got a blender. And I thought, man, I can make this thing better. So for years, we've... we've had the opportunity to build a blender that would not fail. We're an engineering company, so we have 40 engineers. No other blender company has 40 engineers. I'm an engineer, which was a real problem because we didn't have any marketing and sales. I thought that if we had the best blender in the world, that people would beat a path to our door. I thought, if people go into a scoop shop or a smoothie shop or a coffee shop, and then people would go in, they get these fabulous drinks, and they think, wow, I gotta get one of these blenders. I just can't wait. Hey, would you tell me what that name is? And people would literally write it down. And I thought, that's a way to sell. Someone buys something from you and then demonstrates it in a commercial setting. That's the best way to sell it. Not so. We finally decided that we needed to hire a real salesperson, marketing person. He saw a pile of sawdust one day and he asked somebody, what is that on the floor? And they said, oh, that's just Tom, you know, blending two by twos. And, and he said, really? And, yeah, sure. And so he buys a rotisserie ch chicken at Costco and he buys a six pack of Coke and some marbles and rake handles and a bunch of other goodies. Came to me and said, here, blend this stuff. And so I said, okay, and so we filmed blending this. And he came to me five days later and he said, Tom, we've hit a home run. We have six million views on YouTube. And I said, who too? And just because I whetted your appetite, here are some of the videos. These are the top eight. There are eight! And we've got three hockey pucks. <laughs> Number six! Oh, look! This kid's got talent! Number five! <laughs> Number four! I think I'm going to touch the blendception button. Number one!
Sales increased 700%, right? It wasn't just cute, it wasn't funny, it wasn't just a viral, it was viral, but it had an impact on sales. It did exactly what he'd hoped it would do. Okay, so after all of that, content marketing is a no-brainer, right? Well, there's only one no-brainer today. But content marketing can be a no-brainer if it's done right. It's cheaper, it's more effective, easier to accomplish, and most importantly, I think, better liked. You're not offending your consumers, you're actually adding to their, the value of their lives. But it doesn't mean you scrap traditional, right? The idea is that you figure out what parts of traditional make sense in the campaign and what parts of content marketing would make sense, and you put it all together. The bottom line. And the rules by which we play by are human behavior, right? Every organization, I don't care what you sell, is P to P, it's person to person, people to people. It's not stinking B to B, B to C, B to G, which is business to government. But the philosophies of becoming incredibly helpful, being a great teacher, listener, communicator, they don't change. I don't care what it is that you're on, what it is that you're doing. So it's not about size. It's not about what you do. It's about a mentality and a culture. Okay, so now we're all pumped up, ready to go out and make some changes, right? I don't think so. I'd wager that any attempt to make significant lasting change at your organization is doomed. All right? So this next section is not about content marketing, but that and everything else you learn here at Magnet over this today and tomorrow is moot if you don't make cultural and organizational changes back home. So why do you think I might say that? Why do you think that these changes, if you brought them back, wouldn't work? All those guys, who, or women and guys who've been selling stuff for so long, what's gonna happen to my commission, right? Change, change is brutally difficult. This is what I do, my life. I travel all around the world and I try to bring change to places and I know how hard it is to get somebody who's done something for a year, two years, 10 years, 20, to change. Because you're asking them to change the definition of who they are. What you do, go to a cocktail party, what do you do? They don't say, well, how are you today and what's your hobby? It's what do you do? And if I am a certain kind of, I have a job, that's, my, that's how I see myself. Or they don't know how. And they would rather resist then learn how, because to say I don't know how is a sign of weakness. Or they just don't care. <laughs> and we all have a few of those, right? Okay, so our advice is to change your culture before attempting to make changes, because otherwise those changes are going to die. And we believe in inviting, involving everybody, readers, advertisers, staff, and make that risk-taking rewarding. Because if you try to impose change from the top down, and I've been there, I got fired six times, huh? right? I've been, had 18 jobs. I got fired six times for trying to lead revolt against change when I was young. They're like the Viet Cong, right? They're in tunnels. They will win. But not if they're invited to the table of change. Not if you say to them, you can be a victim of change or you can be an enabler of change. So our advice, here's a native ad, fair warning, hire us, right? <laughs> we are the global experts in helping media companies innovate. These are some of our clients. But I'm only half kidding about that. You don't have to hire us, but you do have to do what we would do. You can't just go in and make change. Because you, I've been into companies where people just won't talk to the guy or the woman who signs their paycheck because they're afraid. What if I tell them the truth? What's gonna happen? Will I lose my job? Whereas I come in and all the things I talk to people about are off the record. So what we believe is, and again, you could do this yourself, you could do it with somebody else, you could do it with us, but you gotta do this. You have to empower your managers and staff to together make changes to transform into a 24-7 multimedia, multi-platform content and revenue generation team. Working directly with the staff, I've been in so many places where they have failed before, and, and we said, so what did you do? Well, we went through the spreadsheets. I said, did you talk to anybody? No, no, but the spreadsheets clearly indicated we needed to do layoffs. So if you make changes happen from the bottom up, you build internal teams focused on satisfying audience needs and working with advertising. 
give them the power to control your future. The way I work is I come in, I interview everybody in the building, take down all the lists of things that are wrong, the things they should be doing, what are the ideas. We hold a town meeting. The CEO gets up and says, okay, I hear you. These things are all wrong. I accept that. I didn't know all of them. And now, then what I do is I say, we want volunteers to help solve the problem. You're not just dumping it on the CEO. You guys are going to help solve it. And whether I've been in uh, Asia, South America, Europe, or the United States, I get about 85 to 90% of employees volunteering. And some of these are the guys who sit in the back go, yeah, yeah, screw you. I'm not paying any attention. But they realize that change is coming, and they can either have a hand in it, or they can be the victims. These guys, they said, nobody ever asks me. Right? I talked to people who are entry level, who've been there 20 years, said no one has ever come to my desk and said, so what's going on out there or in here? So because of it's, we need a radical reorganization. We have tried too long to do it piecemeal, just not working. Right? So we think, as hard as it is, we've got to blow everything up. Job descriptions, workflows, publishing schedules, everything, even the office space. We have found if you don't change the way the desks are oriented and change the physical environment, people will think, oh, OK, nothing has changed. It's cool. If I hang on long enough, <laughs> this crazy idea will go away. Right? No one and nothing can be exempt. If you say we have an open office, then guess what? CEO has an open office. If he or she wants to meet with somebody privately, they go to a meeting room. You cannot create little gods and goddesses. Because without a wholehearted, unflinching commitment, they'll Reorganization will fail, and the scary thing is 77%, this is a McKinsey study, 77% of reorganizations fail because they lose steam, they stop paying attention, it doesn't, doesn't work right away, and they give up. And what happens is you're in worse shape than you were when you started. Problems have not been solved, hopes have been diminished, people don't trust you even more than they didn't in the beginning. They feel betrayed. And so the next time you go to them and say, well, this time we mean it, this time we mean it, they're not going to believe you. So I've come up with nine rules for reorganizational success. One is take the long view. Don't try to solve a short-term problem with a reorganization effort. Don't assume you know the problems. If you are an executive, you probably haven't a clue about 50% of what's going on in your company. So interview everybody. I've interviewed pressmen, secretaries, single copy salespeople on the streets in India. They come up with great ideas. Ident involve everybody, come up with solutions, create volunteer teams. And then a lot of people will start this but not tell anybody what, what's going on. So you've got to constantly tell people what's happening publicly. And unfortunately, you have to accept that you probably don't have the talent you need. You probably don't have a data scientist. You probably will need one. You probably don't have people who are doing quality video. But again, you can prioritize, set up a schedule. We'll hire this person here and this person here, or we will train. We have found people buried in the bowels of an organization who were great infographers, who were great videographers. All they needed to do was get some training and be asked. And then look for resistance. They're easy to spot physically. You have a big staff meeting, you can spot them. They never sit up front, <laughs> they always sit in the back, and they tend to fold their arms and look at you kind of like this. Uh, find out what is their problem, why aren't they enthusiastic about working at the company, what could you do to improve their career here? Because I always tell them, look, I don't care if you care about the company, you should care about yourself. So if you care about your future, we're going to pay you to train you, we're going to enhance your employability elsewhere. This is a good thing. Set metrics, because again, just like the, the content marketing thing, if you don't set metrics, then the CEO or somebody could come and say, you know, this whole thing's not working. But if you say, we're going to do this by then, and this by then, and this by then, walk around the building. I had one CEO who hadn't been through the editorial department. He had 30-some magazines. He had 150 employees. He never walked through the, the editorial department. He said, are you mad? Read your damn magazine. Go find that author and tell him or her, great job. He did. Took him a while. And backup plans in case things go wrong. So it, it's time to change your future. This book that I write, it's, it's not cheap, but it's loaded. It's about... 49,413 words, um, wrote it all myself. But we cover things like building blocks with successfully reoriented case studies. And then we look at all these other topics. And just in the ad, uh, the monetization chapter, we look at all these things for monetization. And if you go to just Google Innovation and Magazine Media, you can figure out how to do it. 
Okay, one simple question, and we're getting close to having like 15 minutes left, which we can either skip out or we can ask questions. So why do you go to conferences like this? Another pop quiz here. Good drinks, time away from the office. Solve problems. Solve problems. Yeah. Learn. Learn. Yeah. And we come back from these things all excited and motivated, right? We're ready to go. Print out our notes, put them in a special place on our desk, <laughs> right? And a few months go by, the real world kicks in, we get busy, so we move them to a special place on our shelf, right? After a year, they move to a special place in the recycling bin. And I've done this myself, I know. And we go back to doing things the same old way, but can't afford that anymore. So I want to break that pattern today, and I'm going to ask you to stand up. <laughs> Just uh, any, of the, any of the people who are asleep, this will get them, <laughs> right? Okay, here we go. Raise your right hand, okay? And repeat <laughs> after me. Ready? I, say your name. I, I, I say your name, you gotta hear your name, right? <laughs> okay, good. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Okay. To return to my office next week. To return to my office next week. And do something differently. Based on what I learn here today and tomorrow, I will execute this solemn duty, or I will have to accept a surprise <laughs> guest editor to run my next edition. Okay, you do not have to repeat this next one. This guest editor, I'm, I have chosen already for you, just to be a nice guy here. He's a man with awesome magazine experience. Happens to be a man, has a lot of good words, we need those, right? A firm grasp of the truth, and a track record of making billions of dollars at this. There he is. <laughs> Both of his magazines failed. Okay, good incentive, right? You can sit down. He actually started the two magazines, both called Trump, both failed. Both always had him on the cover. Who's a narcissist, right? Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah.